kids and into different places and teaching and leading in music and uh, leading in crafts and just all different kinds of ways. And if you helped participate in some way this past week, uh, I'd like to honor you. Would you please stand to your feet right now if you helped in any way with our Vacation Bible School this week? Thank you. The official directors, but many, many uh, people had a hand in this, and we saw amazing results. Uh, we also had an adult class that Mr. George taught, and had many participate in that as well. So just a tremendous week. Thank you, uh, church, for participating in that and being a part. Um, uh, in just a, a couple of weeks, we'll start back up with Children's Church again. And so at this time, the children will be leaving this part of the building and going over to another. But it's just a reminder again of what an opportunity we have in our church to minister to children in this community. Uh, we are positioned better than any other to do so. And so uh, we're going to see ways that we can faithfully do that even more. But thank you for being a part of that. and appreciate your participation and su such. And lives are being changed because of that. Thank you. Um, all right. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them with me uh, or a device that you are using. Open it with me to Psalm 131. That's what we're going to be reading today. And it's three short verses that I want to read to you, and you can follow along with me. And uh, we are continuing our summer sermon series uh, that is uh, uh, focused on this grouping of, of psalms. These are psalms. Psalms are psalms. They were psalms written by various psalmists, many of them by, by David, who we know some information about in the scriptures. And uh, this one, in fact, is written by, by David. We know this. And so uh, um, it provides information about, not just information, but, but uh, uh, encouragement toward worship and how we can worship even in the everyday humdrum of life itself, how we are called to worship in every aspect. And this gives us certainly uh, some, uh, some key ingredients and principles for worship. So I hope you found your spot there. And if you are willing and able, would you stand with me while I read this passage aloud? You're going to see it behind me. Hopefully you've got it in front of you as well. Now let's look at this passage together. As we stand in attention to God's word over us. And here what he says. This is what David writes. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child with its mother within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this, this time forth and forevermore. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, your word is truth. We desperately need it. And we do not want to neglect it. Lord, not only do we want to hear it, we want to understand it. And we want to apply its truth to our lives because we need you, Jesus, and your word more than anything else. So please, find fruitful ground in our minds and hearts today to plant the seed of your truth that it will bear fruit for you. Jesus, we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing with us and for praying with me this morning and uh, for realizing the importance of God's Word in our lives. What does it take to be great? Um, I think sometimes we can point a finger at a person that's great at a particular thing. Maybe you feel like you're great at one particular, maybe several things. I think all of us certainly have... Um, um, uh, the, the ability for greatness in various areas, those places where God uh, perhaps makes us this way. Um, when uh, 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 a few years ago I came across a story, and I shared it before, you, you may remember it or you may not, but it's humorous and applies really well to this question about um, what is the key to greatness? Because that's really what David in the psalm is writing to. Uh, and the story goes like this, in the 1800s, uh, there was a traveling musician, and uh, the musician would play an organ that was powered uh, by a pump. And so throughout the concert, the organist, in order to 
resound his music would have to have someone behind the scenes, behind the curtain, behind the large organ that was working a pump vigorously throughout the concert. Without that pump, there was no power to the organ and no way for the music to be heard. And so his practice was, as he would travel from town to town for these concerts, he would just hire out a, a, a little boy, possibly, who might want to help him for the one or two or three nights that he would be in town. And so he came to a particular town and he did just that. He hired a little boy to, to pump the power to that organ that night. And after the concert, there was a large crowd that was there. Everyone stood in admiration for the skill of the organist. And uh, he bowed to close the night as he would be performing again the next night. And as he was walking to his hotel that evening, that little boy came up to him. He paid him his worth for the night. And the little boy looked at him and said, Sir, we really had a great concert tonight, didn't we? And the man gave him his money and he said, You can run on home, boy, but you don't want you to understand that tonight, when, when the crowd cheered at the end and the people were clapping, they were cheering for me. I'm the organist. It, it really wasn't us they were cheering for. It was me. But you go on home and, and I'll see you tomorrow night. And so the next night, uh, uh, the crowds were gathering again for an excellent performance and the organist was ready to play. And he went through one of the songs and it sounded resounding again. That boy was in the back just pumping away. And then he goes to the next number that he would be doing and as he puts his fingers down on those keys, it's just the clank of the keys. There's no sound coming out from where it is. and uh, He's nervous. Uh, he's wondering what's happened, what's going, what am I going to do, how am I going to fix this? And he's looking to see possibly what's wrong. And that little boy sticks his head out from behind that curtain. He says, we're not having such a great night tonight, are we? <laughs> um, um, that, that, that man playing that organ had forgotten that a key to greatness is not always about you. Uh, sometimes it involves other people. And the people that are behind the scenes, the people that support you or encourage you or that are alongside you, sometimes you'll undergo tasks that seem like it's all you that did that. It's many times it. It may be true to a great degree, but oftentimes it's others that are involved. Um, I think all of us have a desire to be great. I hope you do. But I hope you want to be great at something, at your profession or uh, in your relationships. Uh, you want to be uh, great as a friend or as a parent. Uh, you want to be great in the various tasks that you seek to perform it as a student or an athlete or whatever case it may be. And, uh, greatness there's nothing wrong with greatness. And uh, this, this uh, passage of Scripture really speaks to this. And I think unfortunately in the context of Scripture, oftentimes greatness gets a bad, a bad message. Because in the context of the Scriptures, we're called to be humble and meek and lowly and not to make much of ourselves. And that unfortunately, can send a message that we're not supposed to be great. And yet, I think the two go hand in hand as we can see, because I believe God puts a desire inside your heart to be great. In fact, I believe that God made us to shine greatly for the greatness of His glory. Amen. The, the greater we are at what we do and at who we are, what it does is it magnifies the great God who supplies us right. with every energy and every bit of grace that we need for the greatness of His glory. In fact, Paul notes it like this. Note, and you'll see this passage <clears throat> behind me. A portion out of 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Paul says this, Therefore we also have as our ambition to be pleasing to Him. Paul wanted to be great as a follower of Jesus Christ. He wanted to please God with every ounce that he had. Everything that he was and said and did. In fact, oftentimes we talk about ambition being bad, don't we? Don't be ambitious about things. Don't try to push for greatness because inevitably if you do that, then, then that makes you, you're making too great a name of yourself. If someone comes up to you and thanks you for something that you do very well, we quickly, oh, no, 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 it's no big deal. I, I'm really not that good. I'm, it's really nothing at all. No, it is something. If you're good at something, you accept that thanks. And you give glory to God. He empowers you. And 
uh, works in your life so that you can be great for His glory. And Paul said, this is my ambition. Not selfish ambition. That's wrong. That's evil. And has this root our own pride and greed and leads to destruction. Now what he's talking about is to be ambitious about following Christ and be pleasing to the Lord. In fact, in his second letter to Timothy, Paul writes this. He says, I I'm looking forward to the crown of righteousness. He says that the Lord will give to me on that day. In other words, Paul says, everything I'm doing in my life, I'm doing it for a reward that one day I hope I get. Because one day I want to stand among the throng of God's people and have the Lord give me that crown. Because I have been great for His name. And then ultimately we find in Revelation that we take those crowns and we lay them down at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Kings. Right. So there's nothing wrong with greatness. Paul wanted to be great at following Christ. And uh, this seems to be also what Scripture is telling us is our pursuit to be not self-centered, but Christ-centered in our greatness. This often times where I think we get confused. When we're attempting to achieve our own purposes our own way, rather than God's purposes God's way. It's based in our own pride and selfishness and greed. But, but this is not what Paul was speaking of. He was speaking about a God-centered greatness. And so God has created us and saved us to be great at our jobs. To be great as parents, great as spouses, and great as citizens, and great at the different offices and responsibilities. Listen, he's called us to be great at serving, at serving in the community, at serving in the local church. If you teach, you ought to be a great teacher. If you, you work with children, you ought to be great at that and pursue to get even better at that and be great in that area. You ought to be, pursue to be a great singer of God's. God's blessed you with that ability. To be great in these things in every area, oftentimes it's true that, that we, um, uh, we compartmentalize greatness, don't we? In other words, the way I become great in my job is different than the way that I become great as a husband, and it's different than the way that I become great as a church member. They're, they're different compartments. And so I can be great at one and not great at the other. But what Scripture seems to be pointing to is either you're great at them all or you are lacking. And in fact, the way of greatness is not many and varied, but it is singular. It is found in a singular devotion to Jesus Christ. And so in Jesus Christ, He makes you a great employee and a great employer and a great spouse and a great parent and a great worker and a great servant. All these things. Why? For the glory of Christ. Because when you're great, it shows off His greatness. It shows off His glory. And so achieving greatness, how do we do it? Um, in the context of the passage we've just read, uh, this is an ancient, ancient text. The Psalms are ancient. They are used... Uh, in the course of the Jewish faith, not in, in, in Judaism, not just in Christianity. And in the Jewish faith, the, uh, the follower of God would use these psalms, uh, the priest would use these psalms, the traveler who would be going to worship up to Jerusalem on uh, what would be a, a, a uh, three times a year journey to worship there with the bringing of sacrifices at the different festivals that they would hold. As they would do this, they would sing this grouping of psalms Psalm 131 being one of these. As they were making their trek and their way up, they were reminded that God called them to be great. But the greatness is not found in and of themselves. In fact, the author of this points to what really is greatness and how it's found. And what's interesting is, is that there's nobody in the faith of the Jews that was greater, that is greater than David himself. He was their greatest king. David was their greatest warrior. He slew Goliath with a sling of stone. David was the greatest musician. He wrote more of the Psalms by name than any other one we know. David was a skilled politician. He united a divided kingdom, their first and greatest king. The only one coming greater is the Messiah himself in their eyes. He was, he was wise. He was good. And maybe above, in and above all these things, the Scriptures define Him as a man by God Himself who defined Him as a man after God's own heart. David loved the Lord. And it, it, it grew over to every, still over to every other area of his life. And so there was really no one greater than David. And yet there was probably no one worse, was there? 
His sins are clear. If you know anything about David, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He had moments of greed and selfishness because of his poor choices. Not just one, but thousands died because of his inability to lead at the right and proper moments. So he was a dichotomy, a strange case of sorts, the greatest among them and yet also the weakest oftentimes. And yet it was a reminder to God's people, even as he writes this song, that greatness is not defined in one decision. It's not defined on your best day or even your worst. Greatness is a lifestyle, choices you make. Greatness is about a journey. It's a song for the journey. It doesn't happen in a day. It doesn't happen with one choice. And so, while greatness cannot be defined in one good choice, neither can failure be defined in one bad choice. And so we see how God shapes greatness in us through this instruction that David gives us as the Holy Spirit inspires David to write. He writes of exactly what it is. And I want to show you just in three small verses that each contain a certain definition as to actually what's the key to greatness for you, for me, in every area of life. Here's the first thing we find. You can write these down in your bulletin and the notes that you have before you. The first key is this, humiliation. That's probably the oddest one. Um, notice I didn't say humility. I said humiliation. Nobody likes to be humiliated. All of us like to claim that we're humble or want to aspire to be. But humiliation is a totally different thing. But listen, in order to be humble, you have to be humiliated. There has to be some level of this. And it seems the oddest that would fit into place in the kingdom of God in these. But David learned humiliation from two very key prominent relationships in his life. One at the early stages of his life, we see, we read about in the records of uh, First and Second Samuel, King David's life, and the other we see toward the end of his life. One is the king who was his predecessor under whom he could serve. The other would also become a king, but because he ran his own father out. I'm talking about Saul, King Saul, and then also his son Absalom. And we find uh, uh, illustrations exactly for what David understood to be a key to greatness and humiliation in these lives. Uh, uh, in this verse we read, uh, Psalm 131, verse 1, the first thing he says is, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. What he means is, is I don't think more of myself than I should. Right? I'm not thinking too highly of myself. Paul gives us this instruction in Romans 12. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Right? I mean, um, um, don't, don't think too highly of yourself. And he had seen pride be, he had he'd had a front row seat to pride being the downfall of a prominent person in his life, King Saul. In 1 Samuel, we read about the appointing of Saul, the first king of God's people. The people had wanted a king, and so God gave them Saul. And Saul was heads above the rest. He fit the part physically. And, and, and in many ways, it seemed like the perfect fit for what it would be. But quickly, what we begin to see is that Saul allowed pride into his life. Now, he was full of envy and jealousy. In 1 Samuel 13, we, we see where he begins taking credit for what other people are actually doing. And then we, we, we find that, that not, not long after that, um, he begins trying to fulfill other roles that he wasn't assigned or called or equipped to do. He wants to be a priest in a certain situation because he wants God's blessing over the choices that he's made. And so because of this, eventually the kingdom is taken away from Saul because of his choices. His pride. He, he lifted himself up in his own eyes. We, we, we read eventually that he begins scheming, even attempting to murder David, who was his best warrior, the very person who would write songs for him that would comfort him. Why? Because his own envy and pride began to rot him from the inside, which is what pride and envy does in us. It rots us from the inside, destroys even the people that we love and the things that we would hold on to. What really sent Saul over the top is when David defeated Goliath. And when he did people were celebrating and you could hear them singing as they were marching into town. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. 
and it was rotting from the inside. He's in, in his jealousy because he was higher in his own eyes than he should have been. He had a heart that was lifted up. And David saw this leads to destruction. When you lift yourself up too highly in your own eyes, it leads to great destruction. It does lead to greatness. And then he saw with Absalom a different kind of trait. We, we read in this passage. He says, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great, too marvelous for me. Um, uh, we, we read about Absalom. Absalom was one of David's sons. And David loved him very much. In fact, we find one of the saddest moments of David's life being upon hearing of Absalom's death. But Absalom rebelled against the kingdom, rebelled against God, ultimately rebelled against David as a result of this. He wanted David's seat, his place. He was a man driven by pride as well. And he um, uh, tried to take what wasn't his. And so he came up against David. David, by the end of 2 Samuel, is having to leave his throne as Absalom is taking that place. And David is greatly grieved as a result. And then a battle ensues and, and Absalom is killed by David's men. And David's heart is broken. And it was in these two relationships with Saul and now with his son Absalom that David saw the dangers of, of lifting yourself up too high in your own eyes, of, of, of trying to achieve things or occupy yourself with things that were too great and too marvelous for you to consider. And so he was driven away from this, this attitude of wanting to have selfish, reckless ambition as they had. Saul and Absalom were victims of their own pride. And everyone that's around them paid the price as well. They believed the world revolved around them. They didn't realize that they were just a small part of the peace. That the world revolves around God. That we are not the center of the universe. But in fact, it is Jesus Christ who is the center of the universe. And we revolve around His plan. And in order for greatness to be achieved in my life, I have to understand who it is that I worship who is great. And that all glory and honor goes to him. And David saw this being played out. In fact, we read a particular place in his life where he expressed this. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we read of the Ark of the Covenant, which was the representation of the presence of God, being moved from where it had been kept, now being moved to a place where David would keep it in Jerusalem. It would be the place where the temple would eventually be built by Solomon and his son. And David is moving it in. And they have made the mistake of, of not of moving it appropriately. And a, a couple of people had died as a result. And David learned his lesson. And so they were following the instruction of the Lord precisely. The law that had been given through Moses of how they were to move the ark. And, and sacrifices were being made. And people were rejoicing. And David, he was out in front. He was the lead worshiper. Here's the king. And he's out in front. And he's, the Bible says he's dancing for the Lord. He's worshiping with all of his heart. He's, he, he's loving his Lord with all the strength and might that he possibly has. Not out of control. Just, just worship. Just loving the Lord. And as he's doing such, the second Samuel chapter 6 tells us that his wife, which happened to be Saul's daughter, was embarrassed by his activity. How could a king display himself in such a way? How could he, how could he worship without any kind of abandon as David had done. And when she, she said this to him, he in that passage said that he was doing it before the Lord. I was dancing before the Lord. Listen, I wasn't doing it for you. I was doing it for the Lord. He was the center of my attention and my praise. And he goes on to say in 2 Samuel 6, 22, you'll see this behind me. He said, I'll make myself yet more contemptible than this. And I will be abased in your eyes. The word there, contemptible, is the same word as humiliation. I'll become more humiliated than this in the service of my God. And so David understood that to be great, sometimes you have to be humiliated. Humiliated for the cause of Christ because you're not the center of attention. He is. This is hard to grasp and understand, isn't it? Now, those of us who have parents of little ones, uh, uh, they come into the world thinking they're the center of attention. And we help them with this, don't we? We pour out upon them. We, we want to give them love. and We want to show them how to respect. And we want to show them uh, how much we think of them. But we have to be very careful. 
that they understand, though we love them and care for them deeply, they're not the sinner. They're not the sinner of the family. They're not the sinner of this community. They're not the sinner of the universe. Right? Jesus is. He's the sinner. He is the center of all of our attention. And David understood that in order for me to be great at my job, or great as a parent, or great in any other realm of my life, to have a great church, Jesus Christ has to be at the center of it. And I'll become humiliated for his cause and case if that be so. He would clean toilets, scrub bathroom floors, and allow others to get the credit if that meant the glory to God. And that's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for us all. Um, this second part of this verse, David says, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. David is understanding his position. Here's essentially what he's saying. I know where I'm at in life. I'm comfortable with that. And I, don't, I don't have to be in another position or place. I don't have to make more money to have worth. I don't have to have another position to be recognized in order to be great. I realize where God's placed me. If God places me in a different spot, then I'll be okay there too. But I can't learn how to be in that spot until I learn how to be in this spot. David displayed this beautifully. He made many mistakes, but, but when David was a shepherd boy, he was a great shepherd boy. And he worked out with all his heart, and he didn't worry about trying to be the king when he was the shepherd boy. And when he was the king, he wasn't sitting around the throne room saying, well, I wish I was a shepherd boy again. He was just a king. Isn't it true oftentimes that when we're younger, we just want to be older, don't we? I just want my freedom. I can't wait till I can drive. I can't wait till I get my phone. I can't wait till I move out. I can't wait till I get my own job and make my own money and do my own thing. And then when you get all that stuff, what do you sit around doing? Man, I wish I was back in school. I wish I was living in mom and dad's house again. I wish I didn't have the burden and the weight that's on me now. Listen, David understood. Be happy right where you are. Because it's exactly where God's placed you. You be great in that area. You be great in that spot. And you serve it faithfully in that spot and not think, well, if I just had what so-and-so has, or if I just was in the position they were in, then I could be great. Don't think more high of yourself than you ought. Don't occupy yourself with things too great or marvelous beyond you. I read an interesting story about George Washington Carver right here from the state of Alabama who, as a scientist and doctor, created hundreds of different kinds of uses for the peanut. You remember this guy? Maybe you studied about him in school. I remember studying about him. Amazing story. And he was asked once how he was able to come up with so many inventions and creations for the peanut because it was amazing. You know what he said? He said, well, one day I went to God and I said, God, can I know all the mysteries of the universe? And God told George Washington Carver, George, that's too much knowledge for you. You can't handle it. And he said, well, then God, can I have all the mysteries of the peanut? And he said, that's more like your side. <laughs> and that's it. Don't set your sights on things that aren't yours, things too marvelous and wonderful for you. How much pain can we keep ourselves from experiencing? Because we try to figure out answers to things that there's just not an answer to. That's right. You take His Word for what it is. You hope in Him. You wait on Him. Amen. God gives you the grace that you need for every moment. David <coughs> understood that to be great involves humiliation. Listen. David's sins and failings were great. But what David was so strong in in his own spiritual walk is the fact that he was able to return so quickly to the Lord. Take hope in this. You may not feel like a very great Christian. You're in good company. Literally this morning, you're in good company. We fail and we fall. But what David was keen about was that when he failed and when he fell hard, he returned quickly to the Lord. He repented. He returned quickly to where Christ was. And God put people in his life to help him in this. And ultimately, ultimately, our greatness lies in the fact that we have come into a relationship with God through Christ. We've been forgiven of our sins and we realize we have purpose, hope, meaning because of who we are in God. Who we are in Christ. Realizing that, God's greatness works through us. Only in humiliation will we achieve, will we achieve greatness. Here's the second key to greatness David gives us. Maturation. 
First was humiliation, the next was maturation. To be mature. To, to mature. This is what he says in verse 2. Again, I'll read it. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. David compares himself and the key to greatness as being one in which there is a process of maturity. Um, the life of following Christ is a journey. It's, it's not a series of, of just of, of three or four or five events. There may be major events that happen in your life. Certainly, there has to be a place in your life where you make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. There's a place in your life where you make important decisions, but it's a journey of living out that faith. And, and he speaks of this maturing process. And the maturing, maturity he's speaking to is, is, is not really speaking to an academic maturity or, or necessarily an emotional maturity or uh, even an age, an aging maturity. Listen, I think all of you would agree with me. You've met some people that are are in their 60s and 70s, and they're very immature. And you've probably met some teenagers that are very mature. You know, I mean, that, that, that it really is not about an age quotient there. It can be backwards in that way and sometimes because, because it, David here is speaking of a, of, of a spiritual maturity, of, of, of one who knows Christ and is growing in Christ. That maturation, though happening in time, can sometimes happen very quickly. And, and what David speaks of here, he, he compares himself with this process as being that of a child that is being weaned by his mother. This would happen in the toddler years in the Jewish tradition. A child would be weaned from their mother and, and uh, a child going through the weaning process, being pulled away from their mother, the one who is meeting all of their physical and all of their emotional needs and learning how to find uh, um, independence from that in some way. That's a very difficult process, isn't it? Isn't that why we call that the terrible twos? Right? That child is, is learning how to be independent. That child is figuring out what are the boundaries and what are the limitations. And, and there were some things that mama used to do for me all the time. And now I've got to learn how to do some of those things on my own. And the wise parent will carefully tread through that process and will help their child along through that process as they are, are maturing in that. But, but listen, maturity involves a lot of painful losses. The loss of things. You have to lose things. You, you lose things along the way that once you adored or once you cherished in some kind of way. It involves these things. But once you lose something, you gain something much better than that. This is what David is, is referring to. That's maturity. And the word wean in the Hebrew actually means to complete, to ripen, to treat kindly. <laughs> to complete, ripen, and treat kindly. Listen, um, maturing completes you. It ripens you. But, but ultimately, it's for your goodness. It, it, it is kindness to you to mature in that way. Um, our, our community, our culture is overrun with, with individuals that just have never grown up. Men never grew up. They're still playing with little boys' toys. They still have little boys' dreams, and they're not, they're not being men in their homes and their families. Women who, who, who still are immature in many ways, and our culture is reeling from this kind of activity, right? Because the painful process never occurred, and spiritually, the church is reeling from it. With people that have been sitting in pews for years, for generations, their family's been a part of the church, and, and they're not maturing. They haven't matured in their faith. They're, they're not walking with Christ daily. They don't share their faith with anyone. They don't, they don't really read the Scriptures. They're not familiar with what the Scriptures say. And, and so because of that, the church is reeling from a lack of maturity of the painful process of letting go and finding even more. Many people, they just grow old. They never grow up. And so because of this, it's hurting not only the church, but the community and the culture as well. God wants to be emotionally, spiritually mature. He wants to wean us in this way. And David watched this happen in his life. Um, we read of it happening as God worked in others. We see God working in these ways. And, and it's interesting, the word wean there also gives a picture when it says that, 
that, that uh, uh, the, the, the child, um, uh, he says that I've calmed and quieted my soul. The picture there that is really describing is of a farmer leveling the ground after he's been plowed. That's the calm and the quiet. The ground has been leveled because the maturing process is beginning to take place. And so it means moving from dependence to independence to ultimately in Christ, interdependence. You are growing in your faith. You are working out your salvation, realizing that it's actually God who's at work in you. We read about in Ephesians chapter 2, 13 and 14, how God is actually doing that inside of us. This is the maturing process. Um, pretty interesting. I read a story this week, doing some research on this. I read about a, um, an eagle's nest. Maybe you've seen an eagle's nest before. They're not hard to spot. I'm, I'm not a, a bird watcher by trait, but even I have been out with someone before and they've said, see up there, that's an eagle's nest. And usually they sit at the high of a very tall tree, a strong tree. They always build different types of, uh, or in, in the same type of, of trees, though there may be in different locations. <coughs> and, and I did some research on, the, on this part of interesting how a, an, an eagle will, will mature or wean its little chicklets who are inside, the little birds, the baby birds, baby eaglets that are inside there, inside of that, uh, uh, inside of that nest that they have. It's very interesting, the, the nest itself, when the mother builds it, uh, it's, it's made of thorns and broken branches, sharp rocks, and other items that seem like they would be very harsh for baby birds. But what they do is they put a layer um, of soft material around them. For those babies as they're growing. And then as they begin to learn how to fly, they'll jump from branch to branch to learn how to do such until they master the art themselves. But eaglets don't like to leave their nest. They don't want to leave. And so how does the mother bird get them to leave their nest? Very interesting. She will take her strong beak and she will remove that soft material until what is exposed are those bones and those sharp fragments inside that nest until quite literally it's uncomfortable to sit there. And the eaglets have to jump. And this is exactly how God matures us. He puts you in really uncomfortable situations. He puts you in things that you don't want to be in. You wouldn't choose to be there. You want to go back to where you were, where it was safe, warm, comfortable, whatever the case may be. Listen, the good parent does this with their child and God does this with his children. He puts us in uncomfortable places and we, we ask God, why would you do this to me? God, why would you let me be in this place? And listen, there might be many answers to that, but most certainly is this. He's maturing you. Amen. He's maturing your faith because He loves you. He's being kind to you by maturing your faith. And so David says the key to greatness is this, that we be mature in our faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, you'll see this behind me. I have a new international version. This is what Paul writes. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. This ought to be on the door frame of men's hearts. I used to be a kid, but I'm not anymore. I became a man. And I put, put those ways ahead of me. And my childish ways behind me. And listen, it is high time for the church to quit acting like children. Amen. Amen. We're not here for us. Right. The service is not about me. It. It's not here to meet all my needs. Right. It's not here to make me happy or, or to make sure that everything goes well with me. And it's not for you either. Right. Oftentimes we act the most immature. Have you ever noticed this when it comes to music in the church? Have you ever noticed this? How immature we act. My songs are not playing my songs. They're not using the style I like. They don't do it the way that I used to and the way I like it. And all, you know, I want them to play what I like. Well, then go build you a church where you can hear whatever you like and, and you can be the only one there. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm joking. I don't want anybody to leave. But what I do mean is this, is that we have to be mature. It's not just in that area, it's in many areas that God wants to mature us. And it's, it's high time that we understand that, that we have to grow up in our faith. And if we're going to be great in whatever we do to mature in us. Here's the third and final key to greatness which David lays out for us. 
And it's this one, it's anticipation. The first was humiliation, the second was maturation, and the final one is anticipation. And it's found in verse 3, and this is what he says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. And this time forth for everyone. Hope in the Lord. That's the key word there, the hope. The word hope there that, that David writes, as the biblical writers would understand, was not speaking about I hope so. You know how we say that? Well, I hope my team wins, or I hope I get a raise, or I hope they show up today. It wasn't a hope so. It was a, it was a secure knowledge of what God was going to do. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in His promise. My hope is in the fact that one day I'll be with Him. My hope is in the fact that He will do everything He said He would do because He's faithful. My hope stands secure. Therefore, I will do this because I know what He will do. I will react this way because I know my Savior. I know He lives. I know what He's doing. And so, David says anticipation leads us to greatness. David understands that uh, and the, along with the other writers of the Scriptures through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit understand that, 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 that our, our present circumstances are just the building blocks for which the great things God will continue to do. That He will do things in us and through us. Our hope is in this. And listen, hope is so powerful because, because it empowers you to do today what you cannot see happen. It helps you to set your, your, your eyes on sights of things which are unseen. It, it helps you to believe and to rest in things that haven't yet come to be, but you know most certainly will. One day, Christ will return. And it will be very soon. And when He does, His church will rise to meet Him in the air and forever we will serve Him. And, and rewards will be given to those who have been faithful. And to those who, who have rejected Christ, there is, there is eternal separation from God, damnation, and God's wrath. Listen, we put our hope in the truth that we understand the knowledge that we have, even though today it doesn't seem like any of those things are happening or coming about. That's hope. That's hope and the promise of God and what He's doing. Hope has powerful implications in our lives. I read a story from a magazine several years ago. And it was about a gentleman named Eugene Lamb. Eugene Lamb was a self-made millionaire many times over. And, and he, he was wanting to do something good beyond himself with his, with his finances. And so he, he went to a sixth grade class, uh, several classes in sixth grade, in East Harlem, New York. At the time, some of the poorest children in the system lived there. And he wanted to do something good for them. He had a, he had a talk kind of lined out for them to try to give them a hope or try to persuade them or try to encourage them to stay in school or work hard or do something, something of this nature. And, and on the day that he was actually supposed to give the talk, he ended up scratching it right before he got up to speak. And this is what he got up to say. As he looked out across these children, him being a white man and looking at black and Hispanic children. He wondered, how can I say anything that they're going to listen to? My world's so far removed from their world. How can, how can I give them any kind of hope? And this is what he decided to do. He got up and he said this, stay in school and if you do, I'll pay for your college. And he did. And what's amazing is that more than 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school, the highest percentage they had ever had. And as researchers were studying this phenomenon, what they began to understand is this. The reason they did it is they interviewed those students is this. Because for the first time in their life, they had hope. That if they achieved something, there was something beyond. There was another step beyond that it wasn't the end. There was something they were hoping for. There was a way out. There was something that they could set their feet in securely knowing that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's what hope does. Hope <coughs> says everything that Christ says is going to happen. And so in the, the menial task of my life and in the, my attitude, my behavior, and my relationships and everything that I'm facing, I can put my hope in the promises of God and in doing so, can be great. This is what makes us great. Put our hope in Christ. Exactly what Paul is writing. You'll see this verse behind me. 2 Corinthians 4. 
Therefore, we do not lose heart, Paul says. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Paul, in the midst of great persecution, fixed his eyes on the podium. And in the midst of the things we have to face, we fix our eyes on hope by anticipating what is yet to come. Christ reminds us that this world is not our home. Christ reminds us that, that things are bad because this, that's the way this, is, this, this world's going. But there is a new world coming, and we live for that day and that hope that we have. And it's high time that as the people of God will begin to our, our hopes on that. That's right. Not here, but there. Right, yeah. Then, persevere. The Bible warns us in Jeremiah 45 5. Do not seek great things for yourself. Be care, very careful that we don't do that. But it does encourage us to be ambitious about serving the Lord. So don't be great for yourself, but be great for Christ. And be great in Him and with what He gives you and what you do. So here's the question Are you great? Are you great at being a spouse? Are you great at being a parent? Are you great at being a son or a daughter? Are you a great athlete? Are you a great student? A great employee or employer or great at whatever position, place God's placed you in life. Are you a great church member? Are you great at following Christ? David gives us the keys to greatness. And at the end of the day, the Lord alone judges these matters. None of us. But he tells us how we can be great. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we, Father God, we come to you and we worship you in your greatness. When the scriptures tell us there is none good but you, in all morality, you all are good. God, you're not just good because of what you do, it's who you are. God, you are great. You are high and mighty, exalted and lifted up. You are awesome in all your ways. Your, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Your ways higher than our ways. And we confess to you, God, as we recognize that this morning, that sometimes we want to be in that place. We consider ourselves great. We try to achieve greatness for our own purposes and our own use. We are selfish, greedy, arrogant. Please cleanse us of this, God, and help us to point only to your greatness. Lord, in doing so, don't let us carry a false sense of humility, but a God-given identity and purpose in realizing that we can be great for Jesus because Jesus is great in us. Lord, may you make much of yourself in, in us. And Lord, would you guide us to understand that that involves a process of humiliation, of maturation, and anticipation. And Lord, that you'll do that in your church. That you'll do that in these families which are represented. That you'll do that, God, in your people who call upon your name. Lord, we need your grace to do so in us. Because we don't have the capabilities. We fail. We have the wrong intentions and motives. Cleanse us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that it's because of the greatness of your salvation, of your death on the cross and resurrection, that we can have eternal life. And so, Lord, I pray today that as we hang on to this promise, that if those who are here who have yet to come to that place of faith, Christ, they'll come to you. And, Lord, that as your people, as your church, we would be great for the glory of God. Great for your name. Lead us in this pursuit, O oh Lord, as we make that our ambition. Please you. 
to hear you say, well done. Lord, we love you. And we pray even today as we respond to you that you'll have your way in us, Jesus. We ask it in your name. Amen.